Uh, well, as we said a few times before already, Palm Sunday is the day that uh, commemorates uh, uh, and commences uh, Holy Week. It begins Holy Week. It, com- it commemorates the day that, that Jesus rode into Jerusalem um, for his uh, final week of life. It's also known as Passion Week. And uh, it was on this day, the Sunday before the Passover feast, which would have in all likelihood been on March 29th in the year A.D. 33. Um, On this day, Jesus arrives in Jerusalem with a festive caravan of worshipers in this event that we refer to as the triumphal entry. And uh, on the following day, Monday, tomorrow, uh, Jesus will cleanse the temple. And by midday Friday, he will be dead, will be crucified. It was a week that started off strong and uh, then seemed to end with a colossal failure. Uh, Or was it, right? It depends on whether or not we understand what was being accomplished through the death of Jesus. So I want to look at the triumphal entry today and the things that followed. And I I want to just point out to begin with that when Jesus comes into Jerusalem... He makes, uh, he makes a scene. Um, it's the Sunday before Passover. Passover is the event which culminates a week-long festival known as the, week, uh, uh, the Feast of Unleavened Bread in, Jerusalem, or in Israel. Israel has uh, three feasts that are known as pilgrim feasts or fil- pilgrimage feasts where all the, all the males uh, in the country or even who have been in exile in, in many cases, they're all, they're all gathering to Jerusalem for uh, this feast, for the Feast of Unleavened Bread. So uh, Jerusalem is a hopping place. It's normally uh, about thirty to 40,000 people and becomes during this week uh, somewhere between 180,000 up to maybe 240,000 people. It's bustling. It's a a tiny place with a ton of people, and it would have been very easy for Jesus to sneak in to Jerusalem and and basically be unnoticed, which might have been a good idea because Jesus is not getting along well with the leadership in Jerusalem, the the leaders of 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 Judaism's religious system. In John's gospel so far, we haven't seen a whole lot of conflict uh, if you don't count Jesus' first cleansing of the temple in John chapter 2. So there is some conflict, but you don't see a a, a high level yet in John. We're up at, we just finished chapter 4. You don't see a high level of uh, resistance to Jesus quite yet. In Matthew's gospel, by the time you get to chapter 21, where this passage is, not the same story. Uh, In chapter 15, for example, the Pharisees and the scribes, they come up from Jerusalem. That's down south, remember. They go up into Galilee, where Jesus is performing his ministry, much of it. And they want to investigate his teachings. And they ask him, why is it that you don't keep the tradition of the elders? And Jesus responds to that and says, well, you guys break God's commandments. He calls them hypocrites. And his disciples say, hey, did you know that when you said that, it offends them? And he says, don't worry about it. Leave them alone. They're blind guides. And when, blind, when the blind lead the blind, both of them fall into a pit. Okay. So there's some tension going on here. Uh, chapter 16, the Pharisees and the Sadducees, they demand signs from Jesus. Jesus says some cryptic words about, well, you guys know how to read the signs of the sky. But only adulterous generation is going to uh, ask for signs. So he calls them an evil and adulterous Uh, generation. And then in chapter 16, verse 4, he basically walks away from the conversation. So again, a lot of tension building. In John chapter 19, the Pharisees ask him why he takes such a hard stance on divorce. And Jesus basically says, well, your hearts are hard. (laughs) So this is a this is a tense situation, and yet despise the rising, despise, despite the rising uh, tension between Jesus and the leadership, and despite the opportunity to enter Jerusalem, kind of the headquarters of the religious establishment, uh, despite being able to enter unnoticed, Jesus rides into Jerusalem with a shouting crowd at his side. He heads into the city, he goes straight to the temple, and for the second time in his ministry, He cleanses the temple, and this is not the way to make friends with people who already don't like you. Uh, So what's going on here? Why does Jesus do this? Why does he, I mean, those are the events that take place, but what's he doing? What's the meaning of those events? What's the meaning of of causing the stir? 
What's the meaning of coming into Jerusalem with this crowd of people? And I think there are at least four things that are going on here. Uh, the first thing that's going on here is Jesus is making a messianic claim. That is to say, Jesus is claiming that he is the king of Israel. That's the first thing that's going on here. And you can see that in the fact that he is the one who sends the disciples to go get the donkey and the colt. Look at uh, Matthew chapter 21 with me. I'm going to read the first five verses again. Now, when they drew near to Jerusalem and came to Bethphage, to the Mount of Olives, then Jesus sent two disciples. Jesus takes the initiative here. Hey, guys, i got a job for you to do. I want you to, uh, I want you to go, he says, saying to them, go into the village in front of you, and immediately you will find a donkey tied and a colt with her. Untie them and bring them to me. If anyone says anything to you, you shall say, the Lord needs them, and he will send them at once. Now, Matthew's going to give some commentary. Here's what Jesus is doing. This, verse 4, this took place to fulfill what was spoken by the prophet, Zechariah, saying, Say to the daughter of Zion, Behold, your king is coming to you, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a beast of burden. Okay, so Jesus fulfilled, I'm sorry, Jesus initiates the fulfillment of Zechariah 9.9. This promise where Israel's king is going to come into uh, the city, come into Jerusalem, and he's going to come riding in on a donkey. And Jesus says to his disciples, before he enters Jerusalem, go get the donkey. He knows, he knows precisely uh, what he's doing. Let me read Zechariah 9.9 for you. It's the scripture we opened up with at the beginning of the service. It goes like this. Rejoice greatly, O daughter of Zion. Shout aloud, O daughter of Jerusalem. Behold, your king is coming to you, righteous and having salvation is he, humble and mounted on a donkey, on a colt, the foal of a donkey. Jesus is going to ride into Jerusalem, making the claim that he is the king of Israel, the very one whom Zechariah foretold. Now, not only is Jesus fulfilling Zechariah uh, 9, but he's also intentionally following in the footsteps of a very famous king who came before him. Uh, king Solomon. Uh, when King Solomon was enthroned, when he was coronated as king, uh, well, here's the scene. First Kings chapter 1 reads like this. David is, is talking to Bathsheba. Bathsheba is the mother of Solomon. And David says to her, As I swore to you, Bathsheba, by the Lord, the God of Israel, saying, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. Even so, I will do this day. I'm going to put Solomon on the throne today, like I promised you. So, Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. There it is. Where's Benaiah? Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. Uh, and the Cherethites and the Pelethites, they went down and had Solomon ride on King David's mule and brought him to Gihon, there Zadok the priest took the horn of oil from the tent and anointed Solomon. Then they blew the trumpet and all the people said, Long live King Solomon. And all the people went up after him, playing on pipes and rejoicing with great joy so that the earth was split by their noise. Jesus is riding into Jerusalem, making the claim that he is the king of Israel, just as David's son Solomon was placed on a donkey at his coronation. So this is a disclosure of his identity. Jesus is making a claim as he rides into Jerusalem. Now the second thing that's going on here is not only is, is Jesus making the claim that he is Israel's king, but the crowds are recognizing him as Israel's king. Well, let's talk about the crowds a little bit first, and then I'll, I'll, I'll show you where, where we can see this. The, you, get, you get a kind of a three-dimensional uh, perspective on who these crowds are if you listen to uh, Matthew and, and Luke and John. Uh, Matthew tells us in chapter 20, just the, first, the chapter before our passage today, he says that the crowds follow Jesus out of Jericho, which is about 15 or 20 miles, I think, to the east of Jerusalem. And uh, they travel with him. So you've got a whole crowd of people who have taken at least a day's journey, 15, 20 miles by foot, and they are following Jesus uh, to, into Jerusalem. That's Matthew's uh, details. Luke refers to these people in Luke 19.37 as a multitude of his disciples. So these, 
You've got the 12 disciples, and you've got a multitude of people who are in some sense considered Jesus' disciples. You've got these people coming out of Jericho, following him. They're, they're his disciples. You've got at least the 12 plus some now. And then John gives us some really cool information in chapter 12. Jesus apparently, after he leaves Jericho, spends a night in Bethany on Saturday night, last night. He would have spent the night in Bethany. And so then he rides into Jerusalem today, right? Um, he spends the night in Bethany, and he eats dinner with Lazarus, whom he had raised from the, de- from the dead just a chapter earlier. And John says that the people in Jerusalem hear about the man who raised Lazarus from the dead, and they hear that he's coming into town. So they come out of town with palm branches, and they meet them up. So you've got people coming from Jericho, you've got disciples, you've got people coming out of the city to meet Jesus halfway, presumably, carrying palm branches, and they're all flocking around him, and what are they doing? They are recognizing him as the Messiah King of Israel. Look at chapter 21 of Matthew, our passage for today, starting in verse 6. The disciples went and did as Jesus had directed them. They got the donkey and the coal, or the full, the full, the colt. They brought the donkey and the colt and put on them their cloaks, and he sat on them. Most of the crowd spread their cloaks on the road, and others cut branches from the trees and spread them on the road. And the crowds that went before him and that followed him were shouting, Hosanna to the son of David! Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord! Hosanna in the highest! It, this, imagine this huge crowd, they're all, they're all shouting, they're all, they're, 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 it's, it's like a parade. It's this huge scene. And we know that the crowds are recognizing that Jesus is the Messiah King because they regard him as the son of David. Son of David. That, we grew up in the church, many of us. That phrase goes in one year, out the other. We just we know that Jesus is the son of David. Um, it's a huge theme in the Bible. The son of David is uh, well. It launch. It's a theme that launches in Second Samuel, chapter seven. Let me read this to you. Here's where this first notion of the son of David comes up. The prophet Nathan says to David. <clears throat> Well, the Lord says to Nathan, Therefore, thus you shall say to my servant David. Nathan, say this to David. Thus says the Lord of hosts, I took you from the pasture from following the sheep, David, that you should be prince over my people Israel. And I have been with you wherever you went and have cut off all your enemies from before you. And I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones of the earth. And I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and I will plant them so that they may dwell in their own place and be disturbed no more. Moreover, the Lord declares to you that the Lord will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled and you lie down with your fathers, I will raise up your offspring after you, who shall come from your body, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house. For my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. And your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before me. Your throne shall be established forever. I think the point is forever. (laughs) And this is the beginning of this theme of some some ancestor of David, some some somebody coming from the physically from the line of, of David's household. And initially, it looks like Solomon is the one. It looks like Solomon is the son of David. Solomon does indeed sit on the throne of the kingdom, and he builds a house for the Lord, builds the temple. And in some sense, Solomon is the fulfillment of this prophecy. In some sense. And yet, Solomon doesn't quite fit the picture. In fact, it turns out Solomon's actually just a shadow fulfillment, a first level fulfillment. There's another son of David. There's another descendant of David who's going to come. And the notion of this greater son of David becomes this theme. As you read through the Old Testament, as you read through the prophets, we're expecting David to be on the throne again someday. That's the way that they refer to the descendant. They just call him David. David's coming back. 
David's going to sit on the throne. Ezekiel 34. I will rescue my flock. They shall no longer be a prey. Then I will judge between sheep and sheep. And I will set up over them one shepherd. My servant David. This is the book of Ezekiel. David's dead and gone. God's promising through the prophets. I'm going to set David up on the throne. And he shall feed them and be their shepherd. And I the Lord will be their God. And my servant David shall be prince among them. Or Hosea chapter 3, verse 5. Afterward, the children of Israel shall return and seek the Lord their God. After the exile, the exiles will be brought back in, and they shall come, I'm sorry, and David their king, and they shall come in fear to the Lord and to his goodness in the latter days. I'm going to return them to the land, and I'm going to return them to David their king. In those days, this is Jeremiah 33, in those days and at that time I will cause a righteous branch to spring up for David and he he shall execute justice and righteousness in the land. Okay, so by regarding Jesus as the son of David, the crowd is claiming that Jesus is the Messiah. Jesus is the King of Israel. The the whole New Testament opens up with these words. Um, The beginning, uh, wait, These words. The book of the genealogy of Jesus Christ, the son of David, the son of Abraham. He's the one. And he's got this huge parade around him. Acknowledging, recognizing, this is the Messiah. This is, they're, 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 they're not just wondering if he might be. They are parading explosively, as Jesus enters into Jerusalem, the week of the Passover, and declaring, this is the Lord's servant. This is the Messiah. This is the King. We also know that they believe that he's the Messiah because they're quoting Psalm 118, which Jed read for us portions of it just a minute ago. So Psalm 118 is a psalm that, among other things, celebrates the great deliverance of God, his, his great work of salvation. Let me give you, so listen for the salvation theme in Psalm 118. Out of my distress, I called on the Lord. The Lord answered me and set me free. It is better to take refuge in the Lord than to trust in man. They surrounded me. They surrounded me like bees. I was pushed hard so that I was falling, but the Lord Helped me. The Lord is my strength and my song. He has become my salvation. Glad songs of salvation are in the tents of the righteous. I thank you that you have answered me and become my salvation. Salvation, salvation, salvation. He rescues, he saves, he delivers. I'm oppressed, I'm pressed down, I'm being destroyed. The the Lord saves. And then the climax of Psalm 118. Is this scene of a joyful procession of God's people together with Israel's Savior King as they head to the temple and the people are crying out for salvation. They're praising God. They're inviting others to join in the, in the, in the parade by grabbing a branch and going with them to God's temple. Let me read to you Psalm 118, verses 25 to 27. I'm using the NIV. Lord, save us. Hoshiana, that's how you'd say that in, in the Hebrew. Please save us. Hoshiana, Hoshiana, Hosanna, Hosanna. Lord, save us. Lord, grant us success. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is the Old Testament passage that's in their minds. From the house of the Lord, we bless you. The Lord is God, and he has made his light shine on us. Salvation, right? With bows in hand, joint, bows in hand, Join in the festal procession up to the horns of the altar. Where's the altar? Where's the altar? It's in the temple. Grab a branch and come with us to the temple. Salvation has come. We're going to worship. We're going to go worship the Lord. Grab a branch. So when they're crying out, Hosanna, and they've got palm branches, make no mistake, they believe... He's the one. He's the son of David. This is, this is the answer to all of our hopes and expectations. 
Can you imagine the explosive joy that the people of Israel must have thought? Um, is, yeah, mm. Okay, I'm getting ahead of myself. Okay, stop. I want to go somewhere right now, but I'm not going to. Psalm 118. They're quoting it. He's the Savior. Jesus is quite happy with this, by the way. He doesn't stop them. Uh, in fact, this is really great. In Luke's account, you have this great line. Some of the Pharisees in the crowd said to him, Teacher, rebuke your disciples. Right? I don't know how they said it, but it's probably harsh like that. Right? He answered, I tell you, if these were silent, the very stones would cry out. The rocks would start to worship me if they don't worship me. Uh, he's, in other words, I'm fine with the praise. I am okay with being worshipped. He's making the claim that he is the king. The crowds are recognizing him as the king. Those are two things that are happening here. The third thing, at least, that's happening here is that Jesus is picking a fight. Jesus is picking a fight. He comes into Jerusalem. The whole city is buzzing as a result of this stunt, as a, a result of this bold and pronounced claim. This is, uh, again, Matthew 21, verse 10. When he entered Jerusalem, the whole city was stirred up, saying, Who is this? And the crowd said, This is the prophet Jesus from Nazareth of Galilee. So he's, he's stirred up a hornet's nest in Jerusalem. He creates a commotion in a city that's already buzzing with activity. And he has the attention of the entire city who's already, they've already got stuff to do. They're already excited. But their attention is now diverted to this man who comes in. And you know what he does next is he cleanses the temple. He drives out the buyers and the sellers. He overturns the tables and of the money changers. Verse 12, Jesus entered the temple and he drove out all who sold and bought in the temple. And he overturned the tables of the money changers and the seats of those who sold pigeons. He said to them, it is written, my house shall be called a house of prayer, but you make it a den of robbers. Now there's something really noteworthy here about Matthew's account. Let me read to you from Mark's account. I want you to see if you can pick up the difference between the way Matthew tells the story and the way Mark tells the story. <clears throat> Blessed is the coming kingdom of our father David, Hosanna in the highest. And he entered Jerusalem and he went into the temple and when he had looked around at everything as it was already late, he went out to Bethany with the twelve. On the following day, verse 15, they came to Jerusalem and he entered the temple and began to drive out those who sold and those who bought in the temple. Okay, what's, the, what's the major difference other than just they tell the story a little bit differently? Anybody, anybody spot the major difference? There's a, there's an, Mark tells us about a day that Matthew just doesn't even like bother to mention. There's, an, there's a day between when Jesus arrives in Jerusalem and when he cleanses the temple. Why doesn't Matthew mention this extra, extra day? Uh, it's hard to know. It's hard to know for sure. But I, I, it's, it's fair to say that Matthew doesn't care whether or not you understand that there was a day in between. It's not important to him. If you're under the impression that it happened on the same day that Jesus rode in on the donkey, that's fine with Matthew. Matthew doesn't care if you read this and, and hear that there's a new king in town and things are about to change. He, he blends the two of it, he blends it all together. So if Matthew's telling of the story gives you the impression that Jesus parades into town, creates a huge commotion, parks his donkey, strides into the temple like Jason Bourne and takes care of business, then you've understood what Matthew is trying to get across to you. The king is here, and he is here to make war. He's picking a fight. And the temple cleansing is a bold act of aggression, because now, not only is he merely stating that he's king, now he's acting like he's king. He goes straight to the temple, he's acting in authority, as though he reigns over Israel, and as king of Israel, he's bringing reform to the temple because worship has malfunctioned 
among his people. Now, I want you to realize that, that hey, um, can you have her not walk around behind me? Thanks. Um, I want you to realize that the purifying of the temple is the responsibility uh, of the king in Israel. If you, you may remember, or you may not remember, um, but if, 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 if you're familiar with what happens when kings come to the throne and, the, and, and things are in disarray in Israel, if it's a bad king, things just stay bad. If it's a good king, the king cleans things up. Josiah uh, comes to the king and his grandfather Manasseh had made a, a wreck of the kingdom. There were in the temple in Josiah's day, there were uh, like idols to, uh, for Asherah and for Baal in the temple. And so when Josiah becomes king, the first thing he does is he cleanses the temple. He, he removes the, the idol worship from the temple. So, uh, this is what Israel's true king needs to do. This is what the son of David needs to do. And the result of it is true worship in the temple. Let's look at what happens. Jesus cleanses the temple. And then look at what happens in, in Matthew 21, starting in verse 14. The blind and the lame came to him in the temple, and he healed them. But when the chief priests and the scribes saw the wonderful things that he did, and the children crying out in the temple, Hosanna to the son of David, they were indignant. They were ticked when they saw people worshiping Jesus in the temple. And they said to him, do you hear what these are saying? And Jesus said to them, yes. Have you never read? Out of the mouth of infants and nursing babies you have prepared praise. And leaving them, he went out of the city to Bethany and lodged there. So Jesus is not only making an authoritative, an authoritative claim, he is also acting in authority by cleansing the temple. And now he's proving his authority over all of creation by healing. And now he's receiving praise as the authority over the world. He's receiving praise as king and as God. And the Jewish leadership recognizes all of this as an incredible challenge to their authority. They ask, you, they ask him in Matthew 21, just drop your eyes down to verse 23, by what authority are you doing these things? Who gave you this authority? They recognize what Jesus is doing is a claim to authority. And they recognize it as a challenge to their authority by going into the temple and wreaking havoc. They know, they know that he's making a claim and it's not an accident that they're furious. Jesus has defied them. And for the next few days, they want to kill him, but they can't get it. They can't get to him. They can't kill him because everybody's hanging on every word that's coming from his mouth, Luke tells us in 1948. They want to kill him. They can't get to him. Jesus comes to pick a fight. He comes to wage war. The leaders are ready to fight. And it's all a setup for the final conflict. And that brings us to the fourth thing that's happening here. Jesus is preparing to establish his kingdom. And, and, and this brings us to a real, a, a real twist in the plot at this point. Because as the Messiah King rides into Jerusalem, he lays down this challenge to the Jewish authorities. His disciples and the crowds are not expecting the manner of the warfare that he's about to fight. It's really interesting that when Jesus goes into Jerusalem, he does not go to the praetorium. The praetorium is where the Roman governor lays down law over Israel. The praetorium is where Rome exercises their dominance over Israel. And all these people just came into, Israel, into Jerusalem. All of them came in saying, our Savior's here. So where do you think he's going to go? They're, they probably all think he's going to the praetorium. He's going to rescue Israel. And he goes to the temple. And by the time he gets to the praetorium, it's not until Friday morning. And when he's standing there with the Roman governor and being recognized as the king of Israel, it is not a good scene. Jesus stood before the governor and the governor asked him, Are you the king of the Jews? Jesus said, you have said so. The governor Pilate goes on to say in Matthew 27, I am innocent of this man's blood. See to it yourselves. And all the people answered, His blood be on us and on our children. 
Then he released for them Barabbas, and having scourged Jesus, which is no small deal, delivered him to be crucified. That's what happened when Jesus went to the Praetorium. Within a matter of days from this triumphal entry, the king of the Jews is a corpse. He picked a fight that cost him his life, and yet, ironically, by that death, he establishes his kingdom. Because as you know, this death is the very means by which Jesus secures a whole new order. He secures a whole new Israel. He he secures a, a whole new kingdom, a whole new people. Brand new covenant that's ratified by the blood that he spills. The new order is launched by means of the blood that he spills. And the world changed that Friday because on the cross, Jesus actually made war. He did make war. He made war with Satan, he made war on sin, he made war on the old age. He made war on the old you, and he set the old realities aside through the sacrifice of his own life. Jesus is up there on the cross looking absolutely humiliated and absolutely defeated, and Paul tells us that Jesus on the cross canceled the record of debt that stood against us, and he set it aside, nailing it to the cross. He disarmed the ruler and authorities and put them to open shame. Who's being put to shame on the cross? The rulers and authorities. He put them to open shame by triumphing over them in him. He's making war and he's conquering and he's saving. So what's happening with the triumphal entry on Palm Sunday, as Jesus enters the last week of his life, number one, he's making the claim that he is the king. Number two, people are recognizing him as a king. Number three, he's picking a fight that will cost him his life. And number four, by the blood shed on the cross, he is establishing a new order, a new kingdom, a new covenant. I have a few reflections on this awesome train of events. Number one is I don't want you to miss the power of this lamb. I don't want you to miss the power of the lamb. He appeared like such a miserable wretch standing there uh, with Pilate. Like Like a wet rat. On trial like a criminal. The whole system's working against him. The whole city's chanting for his crucifixion. They're punching him. They're spitting on him. They're flogging him. They're They're teasing him. They're bullying him. They're stripping buck naked and hang him up like a slab of meat on the cross. Outright humiliation. And sometimes I think when we consider him in in all his humility and all his meekness and and the and the weak the weakness, the apparent weakness at the cross, this suffering servant, we fail to perceive the incredible strength of the Savior. Jesus was a compassionate and a kind and a tender and a gentle and a humble, servant-hearted and patient man like no one we've ever met. He was all those things. But when we hear those things and we imagine a really sweet and nice and, and sheepish man, we have the wrong image in our head. He was the Lamb of God, but he was not sheepish. Jesus was never more on display as the lion of the tribe of Judah than he was in these final moments of his life, this final week of his life. When the days drew near, Luke said, for him to be taken up, he set his face to go to Jerusalem. Not to the left, not to the right, I am going to Jerusalem. The third prediction of his death in Mark's gospel, Jesus says this, or the, the, Mark says this about Jesus, they were on the road going up to Jerusalem. Jerusalem's bad news for Jesus. Everybody knows Jerusalem's bad news for Jesus. They're on the road going up to Jerusalem, and Jesus was walking ahead of them. 
Interesting comment. And they were amazed. Like, what is he doing? He's, this dude is on a mission. And those who followed were afraid. They know what's coming. And taking the twelve again, he began to tell them what was to happen to him. He knows what's coming. Saying, see, we are going up to Jerusalem, and the Son of Man will be delivered over to the chief priests and the scribes, and they will condemn him to death and deliver him over to the Gentiles, and they will mock him and spit on him and flog him and kill him. And after three days he will rise. He knows, he knows exactly what is to come. This is not a weak man. Check this out. John, book of John. Jesus, this is the Garden of Gethsemane, knowing all that would happen to him. I love how John puts that in there. He knows what's going to come. This is the moment of betrayal by Judas. He came forward and said to them, Whom do you seek? They answered him, Jesus of Nazareth. Jesus said to them, I am he. Judas, who betrayed him, was standing with him. When Jesus said to them, I am he, they drew back and fell to the ground. You ever ever read that? Ever pay attention to that? I am he. The, The... The military guards draw back and fall to the ground. I don't know what happened there, but when God speaks, I mean, he creates galaxies, right? He floors these guys. I am he. So he asked them again, whom do you seek? And they said, Jesus of Nazareth? Jesus answered, I told you, that I am he. So if you seek me, let these men go. I mean, who's given the commands here? <laughs> this is not a weak man. And the wet rat looking dude who's about to be scourged and crucified in total meekness and weakness from the outside is a man who has incredible strength. And power. He rides into Jerusalem like a king. And the great illusion in the crucifixion of the Lord is that he has been conquered when in fact he is making war and securing a decisive victory. Yes, humble and peaceful on the colt, but if you has if you have eyes to see, you'd know that he came in like a tank to make war by dying. Jesus was not bullied into being the Savior. He was an infinitely powerful, lion-like lamb. That's the first reflection on, on what's happening here. A second reflection is that I want you to know that he's not reluctant to save. He set his face to go to Jerusalem. He could not be swayed to the, to the left, to the right. Do you ever live with the impression that he's just willing to uh, put up with you? You're, you're like the unwanted stepchild of God or something that, that, that he, you're some kind of, of chore that he's, he's willing to save you but not happy to save you and I just want you to see the resolve in his actions here he's not coaxed into it he is on a mission to save you he is very happy not reluctant very happy to save you he's there because he's strong not because he's bullied And the third reflection is this. He has not failed us. He has not failed us. His method of warfare is really unconventional. And we don't recognize it a lot of the time. I wonder if there are people here this morning who don't recognize the warfare of God right now, who are are perhaps looking at their life and thinking maybe that God is failing. 
maybe when you first came to faith, or maybe you, you've had a season of faith in your life where you thought of Jesus coming into your life and working in your life and working through your life in a way that's similar to the way that he came into Jerusalem. And maybe at first when you saw him come in in this triumphant display working in great power, you had the thought like, gosh, watch out world. God's about to do some awesome things. When I became a new believer, I remember going, this is so, this is so silly. I, <laughs> so I remember going up to CSU and I was part of this campus ministry and I was right, I was chalking the walks, you know, and I was like, I was like, God is going to rock this place, you know, and I'm like writing that on the, on the sidewalk. God is going to rock this place. Um, oh my gosh. You're just expecting him to move in really evident, really powerful ways. Your quiet times, they're full of a holy joy and the word of God is alive to you and your zeal is strong and fresh and you're, you're praying these bold prayers. You ever sing that song? I want to be your hands. I want to be your feet. I want to go where you send me. You're like, yeah, just use me. I want to go. I'll be your hands. I'll be your feet. Hey, what went through the hands and feet of Jesus? Are you sure? You want to be used? And much like the crowds, you expected him to work a revolution. Do it here. Do it now. I want to be a part of it so everyone can see. And what you found is that God ways, God's ways of bringing revolution aren't quite what we expect, are they? doesn't do it the way that we might think he's going to do it when we saw how he came into Jerusalem. And perhaps, like the disciples, you're wondering why it is that God isn't rising up to make a display of his power on the campus, in your neighborhood, in your family, in your kids, in your parents' life. And instead, you find that the Christian life is wrought with trials and challenges and incredible disappointments and apparent defeat. And somehow in the frenzy of this great expectation that was developing in our minds, we've forgotten that Jesus told us that in His kingdom, the way is narrow and the path is hard that leads to life. And only a few find it. I want you to take up your cross daily and follow me. And as Pastor Bob Brown used to say, there's only one thing to do with a cross. You die. You die on it. That, that's, the, that's what the narrow hard path looks like. It's time, it's time to die. This is going to hurt. God's method of warfare and conquest is totally unconventional. But he is not failing at what he is intending to accomplish. He's at work right, right now, perhaps in ways that we can't see in our own lives. He is not failing us in our trials. He is saving us. And it may not look that way. It may not feel that way. But I guarantee you, He has not abandoned you. He is making war and He is saving you. And the cross is the flavor of His warfare. That's what it tastes like. He's pursuing you. He's healing you. He's rescuing you. So don't be like the unbelieving crowds. Let's not be like the unbelieving crowds who were thrilled at the beginning of the week and at the end of the week, wagging their heads and like, uh uh, no. Mm, no, that's not how we do triumph. <laughs> let's, let's not be that way. He knows exactly what he's doing, he always knows exactly what he's doing. He is always completely in control. He is always performing his will powerfully, sovereignly, wisely. And just as he mysteriously worked glorious purposes in the cross, so now he is at work in our lives very mysteriously, but accomplishing great and glorious things for our good and for his glory. You know, it was only a matter of three days. It was only a matter of three days before his purposes were plain. And in your life too, I promise you, it's only a matter of time before the benefits of his warfare 
are made plain in your life. God moves in a mysterious way. His wonders to perform. He plants his footsteps in the sea and rides upon the storm. Deep in unfathomable minds of never failing skill, he treasures up his bright designs and works his sovereign will. You fearful saints, fresh courage take. The clouds you so much dread are big with mercy and shall break with blessing on your head. Judge not the Lord by feeble sense, but trust him for his grace. Behind a frowning providence, he hides a smiling face. His purposes will ripen fast. Unfolding every hour, the bud may have a bitter taste, but sweet will be the flower. Blind unbelief is sure to err, and scan his work in vain. God is his own interpreter. He will make it plain. Three days, guys. Three days. Let's pray.